Good evening, and welcome to our time this evening together. Let's open by praying together. Father, we pray now as we spend time in your word once again today that you would be with us, Lord. We thank you that you have given us this opportunity to meet together virtually, Lord, and we pray that you would bless this evening's meeting. Amen. Well, hopefully you're with us this morning and you know the events going on. We are pretty normal with everything that's happening this week. The only extra thing is that on Thursday, Andy and Chloe will be getting married in a small, short ceremony. So do be praying for them and praying for all the things that go on as we get closer to them being able to be married. So it's a great week to be thinking about those things. Well, in a moment, I'm going to pass you over because we're going to be spending time in 1 Samuel 21 and the first little bit of chapter 22 as well. We're going to go from 21.1 through to 22 verse 5. And we're going to be thinking about desperation this evening. So I'm going to pass over now and Ali's going to read those words for us now. One Samuel chapter twenty one, verse one, to chapter twenty two, verse five. David went to Nob to Ahimelech the, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, "Why are you alone? Why is no one with you?" David answered Ahimelech the priest, "The king sent me on a mission and said to me, 'No one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on.'" As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what have you to hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread to hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us, as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite. Saul's chief shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Elah is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. That day David fled from Saul and went to Ashish the king of Gath. But the servants of Ashish said to him, Isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Ashish king of Gath. So he feigned insanity in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gates and letting saliva run down his beard. Ahi said to his servants, Look at the man, he is insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you must bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adalam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down there to, down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. 
So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. Well, thank you for that reading. Well, let's just join and pray together before we come to look at that passage. Father, we, we thank you for the way that you have kept us so far through the last three months, Lord, and we pray that you will continue to work in us. Lord, we pray for those in leadership in this world, Lord. We pray that you would be guiding them, Lord. We pray for the states at the moment, Lord, where we see their spike going back up again. And they, they find themselves still in their first wave of troubles there, Lord. So we do lift them to you. We pray that you'll be with them. And Lord, we thank you for places like New Zealand. Places where the virus has all but gone, Lord. Where they've been able to get back to some kind of normality of life, Lord. And, and Father, we thank you for the way that you've worked there. And Lord, we pray that you would be at work across this world, that you would be giving guidance to, to all of those in positions of power, to the people that are guiding them, Lord. We pray that you would be showing them how they can look after their people, Lord. And Father, we, we lift up your worldwide church. We pray that wherever churches are meeting, Lord, that you would be there, that you would be watching over them, that you would be speaking through pastors and vicars and preachers, Lord. That you would be teaching your word, even in this lockdown time. Father, we pray for this country. We pray that you would, you would give us hearts that are wise to the right things to do. Wise to how to act in light of the virus. But also, Lord, wise hearts on how we interact with others. Father, we pray that you would guide us in our inter interactions as we thought of this morning. We pray that you would give us ways to speak to people about you even as we can't see many people, Lord. And Father, we pray for this country and this town, Lord. We pray that your kingdom would be grown here. We pray that you would use your churches across this, this country, across this area, to, to speak out into communities, to tell them of your great love, of your great sacrifice and of the judgment that is to come, Lord. We pray that you would be at work, Lord. And Father, now as we look at this passage in 1 Samuel, as we think about desperation, Lord, we pray that you would guide us, that you would uphold me and speak through the words that have been prepared, Lord. We pray that you would be in your word, speaking into our hearts now. Amen. Well, do keep open your Bible in front of you on 1 Samuel 21 as we spend this time looking at these verses and thinking about, as I said, desperation. In 1948, Jerusalem was being strangled. Arab attacks on the supply road to the west had intensified. The plan was to starve out the Jewish population of the city. It was February 1948. Jewish leadership came under increasing pressure to evacuate Jewish women and children. While it could still be done irrelevant with, with relative safety. But Dov Joseph, a Canadian lawyer in charge of Jerusalem's survival plan, refused to budge. Not with that anguish. Evacuation to the coast seemed the rational way, but Joseph wouldn't give. He reasoned the fighting spirit of Jerusalem's men would be raised if they knew that their homes and families lay helpless behind them. Those men knew what would happen to their families if the city were overrun. Dov Joseph believed that desperation could have its benefits. Now at times that can be true. Sometimes we work hard when we find ourselves in desperate times. Yet if someone is in a position of desperation for too long, they begin to only crave no longer to be desperate. It becomes wearing, especially if, like David, that person is on their own. David now has the unassuming assurance that 
that Saul, if he could possibly organize it, would have his head. There can be no more Jonathans, Michaels, or Samuels. Where should he go? Where would he go? What would he do? All he's seen fit to do so far is run. Escape the danger that he is in. But he'll need more than human protection if he's going to keep going. Now we all have times when we find ourselves desperate for something, whether it be desperate to get out of a troublesome situation or desperate for something to arrive. But at the moment there are many of us that are simply desperate to be able to get back to a normal life. We want to be back to meeting in church, to be able to see friends and family and share with them in special times together. And after three months, the desperation begins to wear thin, and we simply want it over. Sadly, some people have made their decisions, and they've already ignored the rules. And they've gone on to pretend that life is normal. As we see this evening, we must look to the Lord when we are desperate. We must ask him to be over all that is going on for us. And firstly we see desperation and provision. So firstly we look at verses 1 to 9 as we think of that. John Brents, a friend of Luther, and one of the stalwarts of the Reformation, incurred the hatred of Charles V, who made many attempts to kill the minister. Hearing that a troop of Spanish cavalry was on their way to arrest him, he cast himself upon God in prayer. At once the guidance came, take a loaf of bread and go into the upper room where you'll find an open door. Enter and hide yourself under the roof. He acted accordingly. He found the only open door and he hid himself in the loft. For 14 days he lay there while the search continued. The one loaf of bread... Would have, wouldn't, would have been sufficient, insufficient. But day by day, a hen came up and laid an egg without cracking, cackling. The fifteenth day, it did not come. But John Brent heard the people in the streets say, They're gone at last. And he came out. God works in amazing ways. He works even when we feel as though life is going to get harder than we could ever imagine. We must trust in him, for he will provide for us. Just as we saw in Exodus, as the Israelites were in the desert and many other times. Here, as we watch the desperate David run from Saul, we see God's provision be over all that is happening. David goes to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And that's how we open this verse. David had begun his life as a fugitive. He was on the run, and the first place he could go, well, it was the house of the Lord. He went to where the priest was, and Ahimelech trembled when he saw him. He says, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? We see great fear here from the priest, for it was strange for David to be alone in this area. It seems that Ahimelech had heard nothing about the conflict between David and Saul. It seems strange and dangerous to him that David would travel alone. And plus we can imagine that David looked tired and weary and disheveled. And probably looked like he had been crying a lot. But it seems as though he sees that something is wrong here. Woodhouse says, as when Saul had come to Bethlehem to anoint God's new king, the terror seemed to have been aroused because the visitor had, or may have, fallen out with King Saul. Seeing David alone, without any of his men or servants, seemed to have suggested to Ahimelech that David was a fugitive. He didn't know it, but it seemed that way. The sequence to this episode in the next chapter will show that Ahimelech had good reason to worry. But David answers Ahimelech the priest, doesn't he? In his desperation, he answers him with lies about his mission, about those who are with him. He says, the king sent me. 
He said to me, no one should know anything about what you're doing. And my men, they're on their way. Well, I'll meet them later at a certain place. Everything will be okay. In many ways, we can understand why David lied at this point. Maybe we even sympathize with him. Many of us would have done the same thing or worse in the same situation. But at the same time, David would come to horribly regret that lie. And we'll see that next time in, in 1 Samuel 22, verse 22. Trapp says some go about to excuse David's lying here. But that cannot be. The consequence of it was so sad. And afterwards made his soul melt for very heaviness. There was no excuse for this lie. David felt as though he had to protect himself with these words to the priest. Rather, he should have trusted in God. Trusted that the Lord would have protected him through these issues that he was going through. He shouldn't have lied in this way. We need to remember that the Lord is the one who will protect us. He's the one who is all-powerful. He works on the behalf of his people. It won't necessarily make things easier in the, long, in the short term, but provisionally. The Lord will fix things. He already has, hasn't he, by sending Christ. Bringing salvation through Christ's death on the cross. So we must trust in him. But David's desperation doesn't end with the lie. In his desperate state, he is hungry. And so he searches out for food for the journey. He needs help. But the priest notes that he doesn't have any fresh bread for this common man. Now the tabernacle of the Lord had a table that held 12 loaves of bread symbolizing God's continual fellowship with Israel. The bread that the priest had available to him is actually the bread of the presence. It would have been eaten by the priest and would have been a symbol of friendship with God. He says, I, I, I have this bread. As long as, as you followed certain guidelines... It may seem a strange thing to ask, but in Leviticus 24, we see that, that this bread was to be treated correctly. And so David is asked for a certain amount of ceremonial cleanliness here. That the men who will eat it have kept themselves from, from women. And David says, yes. Women have been kept from us. They usually are when I set out. The men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are not holy. How much more so... Today, David continues with this lie here. He speaks of a whole group of men that are with him. But he's alone. But he knows that he's been kept clean. He knows he won't be breaking ceremonial cleanliness by eating the bread. He knows that. But he's lying about the other people. And so the priest gives him the consecrated bread. Since there was no bread there except that bread of the presence. The bread that, that was the old bread that had been replaced by fresh bread that day. And the tabernacle of the Lord had a table where twelve loaves of bread would stay. Some, um, and it would get changed. And in giving David that bread, Ahimelech broke the priestly custom. But not with God's word. He rightly understood that human need was more important than Levitical observance here. When Jesus' disciples were criticized for breaking religious customs by eating against tradition, Jesus used what Ahimelech did to explain the matter in Matthew 12. Jesus approves of what Ahimelech did. Jesus honors him by standing on Ahimelech's same ground. The point with Ahimelech and Jesus is powerful. Human traditions are never more important than God's word itself. If God, has said, if God had said, only the priest can eat this bread, it would have been different. But God never said that. To put the, the only in there seems logical, but it was adding to God's word. 
We must never elevate our extension or application of God's word to the same level as God's word itself. And in all of this, we're seeing the desperate man. But a desperate man being provided for. David came to the house of God hungry, struggling, and God provided for him. It may seem to go against custom and tradition, but that was how the Lord would work for David here. God is a God of provision, after all. And when we come to him, whether in depression, desperation or, or not, we need to know that he can and does work when it is in his will. And we must trust in him. And as the story continues, we're shown that there is somebody else there, seemingly in the background, watching everything unfold. Now, he may seem insignificant at this moment, but when we meet him again, we'll see that the trouble comes from him. Now Woodhouse notes that this man, the Daog, the Edomite, well, he was one of the servants of Saul. And if you remember back to 1 Samuel 19, the servants of Saul had been informed of Saul's intention to kill David. And David had come to Nob because he had asserted, ascertained the firmness of Saul's intent. This man will have known that David was to die. And so this was a dangerous thing. But just at this moment in time, he's kind of a background person. But then we see further provision. As David says to Ahimelech, well, do you have a spear or a sword? I haven't brought anything. I had to leave so quickly before. But in this we see more provision from God for our desperate man. He wants a weapon for the travels. We can understand why David wanted a weapon, why he asked for one, but it's also sad to see that, that this request for this weapon is, is paired up again with this continuation of the lie about being on the king's business. David is desperately trying to avoid the king's business, right? Because right now, well, the king's business is to kill David. But the Lord provides again. The priest says, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, who you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It's wrapped in cloth behind the ephod. And just so we saw, just as we saw with the bread, God's provision here gives David all he's asking for. God provides even though David is desperately lying about his intentions and his needs. But God will continue to work in that desperation for the man after his own heart. David even notes how amazing this is. And, and in that we see David putting his trust in the physical sword. And in that he's doing the wrong thing. We must put our trust in God. And the sword of the spirit. While in our hard times. But David is struggling here. David is a desperate man at this point in time. And so he's putting his trust in a sword that has none like it. A sword without equal. David's desperation has led him to many different things here. He has been led to the house of the Lord in Nob. He's found himself before the priest. But in what follows, we see that he has been led to lie. To sustain that lie about where he had come from and where he was going. Yet God is still working for the furtherance of his plans. He had supplied David with bread and now with a sword, regardless of all the other things that were going on. When we are desperate, we will be supplied by the Lord in whatever way God sees fit. He will feed us either literally or through his word. He will arm us with the things that we need to know and the skills that will guide us through all that we are facing. We must trust in the Lord. Trust that he will supply his people regardless of the situation that they're in. And we must remember that in our desperation we must come to him with our arms open wide. Asking for help. But that's not all we see here from David. 
as we continue, well, we see desperation and praise in verses 10 through to 15. Now, the Duke of Wellington, the British military leader who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, was not an easy man to serve under. He was brilliant, demanding, not one to shower his subordinates with compliments, yet even Wellington realised that his methods left something to be desired. In his old age, he, he met a young lady who asked him a question. What, if anything, would you do different if you could live your life once again? And, and he thought for a moment, and then he replied, well, I give more praise. Praise is a very important thing for people. We often work best when we're praised for the things that we've done. A positive work environment tends to lead to a better team. But here we aren't thinking about the praise of people. We're thinking about the praise of God. Maybe as you look through these five verses, you'll wonder what praise we see here from verses 10 through to 15. Maybe you, you were, think it's a very strange way of living for David as he continued his deceit and as he acts in these strange ways. But what we should note is that at this time, we find that David actually has written psalms of praise to the Lord. Psalm 34 and 56. At the start of those psalms, we read in, verse th in chapter 34 of David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. And in chapter 56, for the director of music to the tune of a dove on distant oaks, of David and Mictam, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. At this time of play-acting, of desperation, David in fact praises God. He says in Psalm 34 verse 1, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. And in, in chapter 56 verse 4, in God, whose words I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So as we read these verses, we should know the praise that accompanies them. We should know that this time in Gath is actually a time full of praise to God. Even all of these attempts to hide in Nob with the priest or in these areas with these lies, they don't last long. He has to continue his escape and now he heads to a very strange place as he heads to Achish, the king of Gath. Now it didn't make sense for the man who carried Goliath's sword to go here to Goliath's hometown. It didn't make sense for the man who was sustained by the sacred bread of God to find refuge among pagans. It didn't make sense for the man after God's own heart to change his address to Gath. David's desperation has once again led him to a strange place. In the previous section to lying and now into the hands of the enemies of God. But as we know from the Psalms, he has not left God behind. He still praises God in all of these things. They look at him and they say, isn't this David, the king of the land? These pagans, they see what Saul does not. Whether they realize it or not, David is destined to be king. They say, isn't he the one that they sung about? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. The song and dance about David that swept the nation of Israel in 1 Samuel 18 was also popular among the Philistines. If he didn't know it before, now David found that, that there was a real price for fame. David was thrown even further into his desperation here. Chased by Saul, now found with a people who had heard of his victories over them. David took these words to heart, and he was afraid. 
David's words of Psalm 56 help us understand what happened here. The title of the psalm identifies as the song he wrote when the Philistines captured him. Apparently, although, in 1 Samuel 21, uh, we, we don't see the details of it, the Philistines had captured him when he was in Gath. David thought he could find anonymity or sympathy among the ungodly Philistines in Gath, but he was wrong. Psalm 56 describes David's journey from fear to praising God as a prisoner in Gath. The psalm shows the emotions that are here and also shows us how David changes in this time, how he comes to trust in God from his desperate state. And in his desperation, what does he do? He acts out. He causes himself to seem insane. He, he worries about what they will do to him, and so he pretends to be insane. He acts like a madman. He marks the doors and lets saliva run down his beard. David was a cunning man. We saw him defeat the, the giant with a single stone, and now he'll gain his freedom with an insanity plea. Akish says to his servants, look at him. Look at how insane he is. Why did you bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you bring this fellow here? David's plan had worked. Akish didn't want to see him in this state. Was David walking in the spirit or in the flesh when he pretended madness? Music says some commentators believe that David was in the flesh and trusting in himself, but the, the change of Psalm 56 happened before David's escape. And it made sense that the Lord would guide David into a path of escape that would humble him. When David tried to protect himself with lies and, and tried to find refuge among the ungodly, he really was acting crazy, wasn't he? When David repented, when he asked for mercy, when he trusted again in the Lord, it was as if the Lord said, you've been acting like a madman. Keep the act going and I'll get you out of this. As a result of, of the workings of God here, we see praise due his name in Psalm 34 as David is driven away. He's freed from captivity among the ungodly. David is especially joyful in his praise of that psalm because the Lord got him out of a mess that David made himself. God's amazing goodness is shown here when he delivers us when we don't really deserve it. David was running from Saul, and as we've thought about, he ran in his own strength during this time, and, and that is how he ended up in this terrible situation. But as we see with these verses paired with the Psalms, he has now realized the error of his ways. He's been praising the Lord for the salvation he has seemed to bring him by the final verse. Achish did not want him around due to what seem to be his insanity and so he drives him out but by doing this God saves David from the trouble that he was in as we continue through this passage we see this call to trust God to know that he will do amazing things on our behalf but along with this we should be like David as he acted in the Psalms praising God for the work that he has done the work that he is doing and the work that he is still doing. We should be praising him continually for the great work of salvation that was done for us at the cross. And we should acknowledge the true desperation that we would be in if we did not have the Lord Jesus as our Saviour. And finally, as we close this evening's passage, as we look at verses 1 to 5 of chapter 22, we see desperation and providence. Osterwald said, God's providence overrules all things. God confounds the proud. He takes care of the weak and afflicted who fear him. He protects them in danger. He hears their prayers. This is a doctrine full of consolation to good men. 
supporting them in their trials and leading them to holiness and trust in God. God's providence is a great work of grace. When God gives us the things that we don't deserve, David has not been showing his faith in the Lord in many of his actions in this passage, but God has continued to be at work. He gave him the provision of the bread and the sword of Goliath. He protected him in the face of Achish and brought him to a place of praise at the end of the previous chapter. And now as we continue, well, we'll see the way in which he provides for David in his desperation once again. We must remember that God is a providing God. He has provided us with many things already and we will continue to see that as we walk with him as king of our lives. And look at the start of verse of chapter 22. David leaves Gath, having been driven out and escapes to the cave of Adalam. David had been through a lot. He had had the highs of immediate fame, a recent marriage, dangers from the Philistines, repeated attempts on his life, and a heartbreaking farewell from, from everyday life to live as a fugitive for who knows how long. Then David had a brief but intense period of backsliding, a dramatic turn to the Lord and deliverance from a life-threatening situation. I'm sure that if we think about our lives, we'll see many times as we've gone through ups and downs when it comes to our relationship with God, but we must remember that God is the one who is constantly working as he calls us back to himself. David had nowhere to go, and so he found a humble cave to hide in. And at this point, David once again shows his desperation in the Psalms. In Psalm 142, he cries out from the cave for the Lord. In Psalm 57, it tells us of the strength that is provided for him. At this time, God did this in many ways. God has providence over all of these things. And we see that through the next few verses. Firstly, we we see his family come to him. These brothers who had mocked him in chapter 17 now came to encourage him. Now came so that he was no longer alone. But not only that, all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him. And he became their commander. God provides many others, men who were unhappy with Saul's leadership. Samuel had warned the people about what would happen if they had a human king, didn't he? Back in chapter 8, he said they would take the best of all your things. But now the reality was setting in. It was hitting home and they were distressed, in debt, discontent by having this king. About 400 men were there with him. God was providing a group of supporters. David had been rejected by the king, yet God didn't leave him alone, did he? Redpath says, these are the kind of men who came to David, distressed, bankrupt, dissatisfied. These are the kind of men and women who came to Christ, and they're the only people who come to him, for they have recognized their distress, their debt, their bankruptcy, and are conscious that they are utterly discontented. The sheer pressures of these frustrations drive them to the refuge of the blood of Christ that was shed for them. These men came to David in in desperation, in debt, in, in discontent, didn't they? They didn't stay that way, though. David made them into the kind of men described in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 8, mighty men of valor, men trained for battle, who could handle their shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lion and were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. God was providing Not just for David here, but for all of those who were in desperation. He provides them with a leader in David. He provides them with others who likewise were under pressure from the wicked king. God was providing them with his chosen king to lead them. Just as God provides the desperate people of the world, the true king 
in the form of Christ. And from there, David goes to Mizpah in Moab and says to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother stay until I learn what God will do to me? And he leaves them there. And they stay there as long as needed. David takes his parents to Moab because, as we thought about on Wednesday night, his great-grandmother was a Moabite, Ruth. He wanted his parents to be safe in whatever battles he may face in the future. David doesn't know the whole story yet. He knew he was called. He knew that he was anointed to be the next king of Israel, but he had no idea how God would get him there. David had to trust and obey when he didn't know what God would do. And once again, we see that God provides for him in the protection that his family are given in Moab. We're seeing fruit from the faithfulness of Ruth more than a century later. God's providence over all of these things has been planned out from long ago. But this is not the only way we see God's providence as, as the prophet Gad comes to him. And this is where we find our final act of providence as we see the message from the Lord. David is uh, enjoying the support and the aid from the prophets. Saul dealing with the prophets, such as Samuel, was almost always negative because Saul resisted the word of God. David received God's word. God's counsel to David was received. He, he told him to leave his own stronghold, to go back to the very stronghold of Saul. This probably wasn't what David really wanted to hear at this point, but he obeyed anyway. David had to learn to trust God in the midst of danger. Not on the other side, not, not hide away. He says, don't stay here, go. And look, David listens. He leaves. He goes to the forest of Hera. This desperate man, in this desperate situation, has been protected, provided for. He's been brought to praise. And now he's been spoken to by the Lord. And when we find ourselves in desperation in the world, do we always remember to turn to God? Or do we often run in our own power, in whatever direction we think is best? Do we think that we can sort our own issues out? Often we do, don't we? And often that's our downfall. We deceive ourselves, just as David did, into believing that we should do whatever it takes to make sure that we're safe. We'll run and hide. We'll look for strength in the world and hope that it'll be enough. But that's not what we should do. David has attempted to do all of these things in this passage as he has run from Saul. Yet God has been in each and every step. As he lied to the priest about where he had come from and where he was going, God gave him provision that he would need. As he ran to the enemies of God and found himself in trouble, God brought him from a place of fear to a time of praise. And when he secluded himself in a cave, God provided him with 400 men. He provided protection for his family, provided a prophet to direct his way, when we're in desperation, we must turn to God. We must know the way in which he has worked through history. We must see the way he works and trust in him to work on our behalf. We must look to God for all the things that we need as we walk the path that is before us. No matter how hard it seems, we're being called in this narrative of David to trust God in God, to believe that he is bigger than the troubles that we face, and praise him for the great work of salvation that has already been done on our behalf. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for that work, and Lord, we pray as we find ourselves in desperation in this world that we would turn to you, that we would ask you for your guidance, Lord. Father, we pray that you would be in all we do, that you would show us how to live for you, Lord. Amen.
let's sing our closing prayer together now. <laughs> in prayer together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of David as he goes through these desperations, Lord, and we pray that we would take confidence in you through the way that you worked for him. Father, we pray that we would remember to always come to you as we sit in a world that feels like it is in such desperation. Lord, we pray that we would know to come to you for all we need. We pray that we would trust in you and that we would praise you in spite of all of it, Lord. We pray you would be with us now. You would be watching over us, Lord, and guiding us. You would bring us back safely to meet again. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. And I hope to see you again through the week and into next week. God bless.